Comandante or Commander is the story of the captain Salvatore Todaro, a captain of the Italian submarine that during the Second World War, after sinking the enemy's boat, he was saving the enemies. For the law of war, he had to sink the boats, but for the law of sea, he had to save lives. Battles, water scenes, having a submarine in the middle of the ocean, rescuing and fighting. The show needed this to look real, and they were having difficulties finding a way to do the submarine stuff in the mid-Atlantic practically. It came very quickly apparent that we could not do green screen or blue screen. So luckily, we're in the moment of LED walls, Unreal Engine, and a way to actually do this in a real-time, on-set sort of way. So we ended up in coming up with a paradigm that we're calling a near real-time workflow. We wanted to do it in real time and we wanted to be able to show the director full quality as quickly as possible. He wants to see how it works on the day, feel like he's made the right selects and walk away knowing he's got it. Hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today on this uh, panel of uh, virtual production uh, with Group On Set. Um, we, we just showed you is uh, a small a uh, small portion of a video that uh, we have on our YouTube channel uh, on uh, the Foundry uh, YouTube uh, channel site um, about Comandante, which is a really amazing uh, and interesting project uh, that uses uh, virtual production and a technique called near real time. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, several of the collaborators on this project to talk about uh, some of the techniques that were used in Comandante uh, and to talk more broadly about virtual production and where it's going and uh, some of the uh, different uh, dynamics involved in how to move the state of the art forward in virtual production. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining me here today. Uh, this is going to be a panel where uh, we'll be interacting uh, with, uh, with uh, these, uh, these valued guests. Uh, and also please interact with us in the chat uh, asking questions, and we'll be taking some questions afterwards. Um, so let's start with some introductions. Uh, so myself, I'm Matt. I'm from Foundry with the uh, research team. And um, really, the stars of the show are uh, Kevin, Patty, Liza, Dan, and David. So I'll get each of you to maybe introduce yourselves uh, one at a time. Um, Kevin, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, then we'll uh, move on to uh, the next person. Okay. Hi. Um, well, um, Kevin Haug, I'm the visual effects designer for the project. So on some level, I'm kind of the instigator for, you know, at least one or two of these people who then branched out to all the rest of them. Um, so I, I'm the production side of this. I represent the movie, I suppose. Great. And uh, Patty uh, from Cook, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Patty Green. Um, I am the eye technology project manager for Cook Optics, and I've been working on lens metadata at Cook for like 10 years now. Great, uh, fantastic. And uh, lens metadata was a big, big part of uh, what helped this whole project work. Um, and Eliza uh, from Hi-Res, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm um, a creative producer at hi -Rise working in virtual production, and we work specifically in specifying and integrating as well as consulting on virtual production solutions. So LED um, and working on set, basically from pre-production all the way through to post. Fantastic. And uh, Eliza, if I recall, um, Iris was uh, key in um, getting Foundry involved in this project. So uh, huge thanks to Stenti for that. Uh, and uh, Dan Hamill from 86. Yeah, hi, I'm Dan. I'm the co-founder of 86 and Virtual Production Studios. Um, obviously, we held some great tests with the, with the whole team um, at ours. So I'm kind of responsible for the LED through those tests. And uh, the distinguished David Stump, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm Dave Stump, ASC. I'm a cinematographer, visual effects supervisor, and author. And I've been told I'm the godfather on this film, <clears throat> but uh, I'll be doing craft service. Fantastic. And uh, 
casting. Um, so uh, this is this is just really it's really wonderful. You know, when we worked on uh, Comandante, uh, one of the things that uh, I think we we always wanted was to be able to gather all of the folks who were involved in the project to talk about it in, in more detail. Um, and this is just a, a great opportunity. Um, so without further delay, I'll, I'll get into a little bit about the questions about virtual production and maybe we can dig into uh, some of the things that we think are especially interesting in regards to uh, what was done on Commandante and also uh, the broader trends in virtual production uh, and what's really required to help move the state of the art forward and what some of the, uh, some of the headwinds and, uh, and obstacles are in order to do that. So one of the things I've always uh, thought since you know virtual productions you know, kind of came came up as this very flashy thing in a way over the last few years. And um, if you sort of look at it at face value, it looks like this uh, you know, this cutting, you know, this clear cut uh, new way of filming. And um, you know, it, it just it seems really sexy and cool. But in reality, uh, it's much more uh, it's much more subtle. It's more of a paradigm shift and it's a blend of many different technologies in fact you know people don't always agree on what exactly virtual production is when they're talking about it because there's different you know meanings to it depending on pre-production on set or post-production um, but what I'm really interested in is uh, what was really unique about Commandante uh, I'm really curious like what 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 you guys feel set this project apart in terms of how it approached uh, virtual production and uh, Kevin, I think you spoke really eloquently in the, the video about uh, connecting that to the, the creative direction of the film itself. Um, maybe you could uh, kick us off. Sure. I, there's there's a couple of basic things that make Comandante sort of the project that had to drive the paradigm in a particular direction. Um, first off, the you know, I, I would say Dave and I both worked in uh, a very similar paradigm that happened before digital uh, or just as digital was going away. Um, on some level, this is process photography made infinitely better than it ever used to be. Um, uh, so I'm looking at this, you got to put people on a boat, okay? You have to put them in the middle of the Atlantic on a submarine and, and it's, not safe it's not practical it's not sensible to even try to do it even though the director really did try in many ways um and this director is uh, you know is, he's a, a new generation of director who likes to do things old school so we're looking at how do you do it so that he can do that and what does old school mean in this case it really means that he doesn't want to turn the look of the movie over to a, a subcontractor for you know long after he's done making the movie he wants to be able to make the movie and see it on the day and walk away going done it and all of the creatives who he pulled around him he wants them to put their two cents in while there's time for them to do it not you know if they can find time between the two shows that they're going to do while we're still in post you know sort of drop their two cents in so that drove a lot of this it needed to happen as quickly and in as real time as it could um, but it couldn't happen in actual reality. You know, you couldn't really do it. Um, and part of that problem is also that real-time simulation of water isn't something that's possible right now. And probably it's one of those uh, Zeno's paradox things. You'll never get better than halfway there because if you can do 10% better by giving it an extra half second of render time, you're going to take it. You're not going to do it in real time. And that that sort of set us all up for what are you for what we're doing which is how do you get beautiful fully rendered water presented to the director on the day or at least in dailies with the rest of his crew so he can say done it uh, also actually a third thing this project had like over a year of development wherein they were willing to try to figure out how to do it and very short window of post so um here we are trying to get it all done in prep yeah, that's that's really fascinating, and, and I, I love I love the aspect of this project that's driven um, mainly by that that problem. How do you you know have this this epic uh, you know sort of type of film on water and the war setting and all of this, but all the complications associated with that? 
and then bringing to bear all these different technologies like lens metadata, camera tracking, LED walls. And I think that brings kind of one of the, the challenges, I think, that we, we see in virtual production today, which is, you know, a, a lot of these, uh, these shoots are done by bringing together disparate pieces of technology and linking them together in order to get the final product. And virtual production is going through a process where we're trying to figure out standards around the right way of, uh, of, of kind of agreeing on basic things to make these, uh, these shoots run smoothly and not having to reinvent all the wheels. And hopefully we're moving quickly to the point where we don't have to reinvent the virtual production wheel every time. Um, so let's talk about standards a little bit. I mean, there are folks involved in standards process like SIGD who are doing really great work and, and, and others. Um, and, you know, Patty, I'm especially uh, curious for yourself, like, and, and others as well, if you, uh, please jump in. Um, but what standards do we really think are like the most foundational and urgent to kind of move the state of the art forward in virtual production today? I think that's a really great question. Um, Cook has been working on lens metadata for more than 10 years. It was Les Zellin's brainchild. And he anticipated wanting people on set and post-production wanting lens data even before there were digital cameras. So Cook's been doing this for a long time and it's evolved during that time. Um, we have established what we call iTechnology protocol and a lot of people in the industry have joined us in that partnership to adopt that protocol. But um, there are still additional problems we have like cameras that record some of the lens data, but they don't necessarily record all of it. Um, there are problems where lens data isn't necessarily synced to the time code on the set. And then we don't really have a specific file format for storing all of that metadata so that everybody in the, throughout the workflow can access it. So, you know, what metadata is absolutely essential? What's metadata that would be nice to have and who needs it? These are all questions that we're really trying to help address. And I just, you know, I really think this project goes a long way toward opening the door to trying to solve some of these problems. And so we're really excited to see the lens data getting used and working with the Commandante team and the Foundry and, uh, you know, let's let's keep the ball rolling. Yeah, and Dan, you know, you, you you've uh, uh, yourself and, and Eliza as well. I mean, you guys are, are, are probably seeing like a broad cross section of different virtual productions, different people applying different techniques and technologies to to pull off their shoots. Um, where do you see the the standards process needing to come to bear the most? I mean. But metadata obviously is one of them. Are there, are there other areas where you see people kind of coming in on set and stuff being really tricky just to, to hook together and then trying to, you know, take it away into the, the later stages of production being challenging because of lack of standards or things that need to be invented on the go? Where, where's, where, where are some of the pain points that you guys see in your, your kind of broader view of, of productions? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of the virtual production is kind of is happening at the moment obviously is with with kind of two mil high resolution led um you know like the, all, most of the shoots like that and now you know with the the techniques that the commando is using we're using like lower resolution products you know we're still getting uh like great light output from from kind of the cb5 and obviously given the type of production where these styles are kind of getting wet it's it's just an interesting way of using other products now which weren't you know up until this production was on the cars wouldn't have been particularly well weren't going to be used um like this so yeah it's it's, it's great it's kind of opening up uh, uh, opening up other options really now um you know it doesn't have to be two mil all the time and that's going to affect budgets as well which is going to be kind of exciting you know we see all these huge volumes that are being built um with thousands of tiles of kind of high res two mil products um and you know with this whole ne ne like near real time uh technology kind of coming through it's going to give us um so, some really interesting options to build like the larger volumes with lower resolution panels um which which is kind of really exciting it seems that we've lost elijah i think we'll, we'll, we'll uh we'll pick on eliza for some of the next questions when she gets back uh 
David, I'm, I'm kind of curious as well. Like one of the things I've heard um, from some folks is that um, you know virtual production became so kind of hot that a lot of folks are just like, I want to do things, you know, like the Mandalorian way. I want that LED screen stuff, right? Um, but obviously, as you know, a cinematographer and having to kind of make all this stuff work, it, it's it's not that easy. You know, part of having technical standards is that it makes the conversation with uh, clients about what's feasible or not feasible a little bit easier. How do how does the standardization process or the process of adopting a common language around virtual production uh, help in that conversation with clients and uh, with folks who are um, kind of you know starting to get into it and looking at it as a filming technique? Well, one of the things that um, it's becoming obvious to everyone that we're encountering in creating standards for this uh, and is the, the need for uh, uniformity in terminology and definitions. Uh, I've been working with one of the uh, imaging scientists at ARI to create a, a little, well, not little, massive spreadsheet that we call the concordance, which gives you a list of all of the camera parameters that we're, we're talking about for every camera that we could find. And it is a jumble of different cameras calling the same parameters different names and uh, not agreeing on the measurement of those parameters. Like for example, something as simple as uh, what, what does the focal distance mean? Well, is it measured to the uh, entrance pupil? Is it measured to the imaging plane? Is it what's on the side of the, the lens barrel? Everybody seems to have a different different definition of what that is. And that list goes on and on and on, sort of outlining all of the differences in definition that everybody are using for their metadata. So the standards effort in part is a glossary effort, uh, an on, uh, ontology effort that is going to unify terminology for, for all of the cameras. And uh, one of the things that's difficult about doing that is the logical self-interest of commerce. No one vendor, no one camera manufacturer can say, okay, let's all do it our way because uh, that's a conceit that everybody is going to push back against, which is where a body like the ASC comes in. The American Society of Cinematographers can steer this because we don't have a dog in the fight. We don't care whose definition wins as long as someone's does. And um, one of the things that I do as the, the chair of the metadata subcommittee there is I try to wrangle uh, manufacturers with the intent that we are going to create the tools of our own uh, profession. So uh, here is a body that you can come to that is uh, a safe agnostic body to, to urge for standards and, and usage and, and practices. And uh, we're very effective at that. And uh, it's really great seeing um, a project like this where uh, for example, uh, Cook Optics can come in, you know, erate in the, the heat of battle and um, form, like you said, uh, David, the, the uh, broader, you know, broader establishment standards. I think this, this leads to, to understanding and dialogue. Um, that's really great. Um, you know, I'll, Actually, Matt, yeah, if, if I could jump in quick, uh, the, the, the one thing that I think got to be said by somebody who isn't at Foundry is that one of the uh, things about this project that Foundry has brought to it is this idea of keeping a track of the metadata in a way that's uh, transferable through not just near real time, but actually down into post. And this is what's critical about standards. Is it, it's what people are missing, is if there isn't a way to record it, in a way that can be transferred onto other vendors and other ways of doing it, it's going to get lost. I mean, it's getting lost right now because nobody knew they needed it or wanted it or it got in the way of bandwidth or just didn't understand what it was there for, so they didn't do it. But there's also, even when you want it, 
if you can't find a standard way of recording it, it's just as useless as if you didn't do it. And that is something that we're working on because we know we have to have the data in order to be able to quickly in any kind of reasonable way see a new composite that everybody can agree upon. And this is something that, frankly, uh, it, it's why I'm talking to high res Peter Canning, uh, who's one of uh, Eliza's partners, was like, well, you need to talk to Foundry. They're working on something like this. So this is how we kind of, everybody's like, oh, you need to talk. Because as we were talking about metadata, we were in one of these Zoom sessions and Dave said, let me see if Patty's on the phone. And then we got Patty in here to find out. You know? <laughs> so it's, there's a lot of people who have this the potential energy of what to do with their metadata, but nobody's actually found a, a hose to spray it down. And, and that is really what to me is possibly the most interesting thing about what we're trying to do is that we're finding a way to record it and use it, not just sort of go back. I, I can imagine every show has at least one coordinator for every vendor trying to take the camera data that they've laboriously done by hand and turn it into a spreadsheet that that vendor can understand and therefore use at all. Even though it exists, they may not be able to use it because it's not in a form that they can use. This is one of the and problems we always ran into with lens data. We are a lens manufacturing company. Once the data leaves our lenses, we don't have any control over it. So um, you know, we've tried, uh, when we um, started introducing our distortion data, we decided, okay, we're not only gonna just load that data into our lenses, we're also gonna offer that ability to retrieve it through your serial number by downloading it from the cloud. So if somebody hasn't gotten that data on set and they decide in post they need it, there's still a way to retrieve it. And, and I think I need to point out that the traditional way up until, maybe up until we started doing 3D cinematography, the traditional way to record metadata was as something I call meta paper that lived in giant notebooks in the visual effects department or editorial department of a movie. And it was a little bit like an exercise in using a card catalog at the library. Uh, it was really uh, a Herculean effort to track any kind of data and attach it to any kind of image files usefully. Yeah, and, um, I, I, at first I thought um, Kevin was setting me up for the next question, but I feel like we're, we're already exploring it. Um, and really the question is, you know, virtual production is all about letting um, folks at uh, the early stages of production, principal photography, you know, directors, uh, DOPs, you know, uh, GFX scores, everybody to see something as close to the final image as early as possible. And um, that kind of compression of the, the process is really key. Um, and, you know, I've always felt, especially, you know, given how we, we work in the business foundry, like, that's almost uh, a counter reaction to the traditional way visual, visual effects works where, you know, after principal photography, shots just get sort of bit out and, and uh, sent out across multiple people who, you know, are almost oh, in one way or another, for better or for worse, are working a little bit in a silo. This idea that you can see much more on set and directly is, uh, is, is kind of a way of, um, of, of uh, reversing that. Um, so it's almost like a, 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 a real time loop but in the end, things do go into post-production, right? And they, they do go and get finalized and um, there needs to be a continuity. Uh, and we mentioned, you know, lens metadata and that type of thing, but what other types of things were in the, the meta paper? Uh, what other types of things are we learning in virtual production? Because in a way it's almost like uh, the last mile of the process of uh, digitizing film production in a way. Um, what, what are the other pieces that we, you know, you guys have seen that are really important to kind of digitize and create continuity. And we have Eliza back. So I was about to apologize for Eliza's uh, temporary absence, but uh, she's back. Um, so yeah, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the bridge to post-production, how, uh, how we get there given the new, you know, the new world of virtual production. But David, go for it. Well, there's a, there are a number of efforts underway to to start using something like a USD file format as a, a bin to dump all of this data into that um, 
allows us to stick it to the images and, uh, <clears throat> and track that. Uh, and there are other efforts underway to adhere more of this data to the actual image files. And uh, we're even talking about opening up some of the metadata capabilities of ACES through the Academy. So uh, now that there is an awareness of this, and now that we're, we're out of the chasm of the adoption curve of, of this technology, uh, people are starting to address the hardware needs and the software needs that, uh, that, that transport the data along with images. Eliza, if if you're, uh, hope, hope you, I, I realize you've, you've turned off your video to, to try to keep the, your connection stable, uh, but I'm quite curious with, with high res as well, uh, you guys having worked with lots of different productions, um, what types of things are, are you seeing uh, needing to be captured, you know, on set, uh, you know, in, just in terms of uh, where does where does the, the where does the process break down? Uh, between principal photography and post-production where you know new tools or new types of data would get captured. Um, you know, Hi Pyrus has an interesting perspective kind of seeing it uh, all, all in action. Um, where, where do you think we need to, um, where do you think we need to build new bridges given you know, the new capabilities of virtual production? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Sorry. I've yes. Bad connection. <laughs> Uh, I, interestingly enough, I sorry I dropped out when you were talking about standardize, standardizing things. And um, relevant to this question, also for me, it's it's really simple things like language. Um, we're now collaborating from many industries on set. You know, we have server operators, we have graphics people, we have DOPs, directors, and while we're all working together, we actually all have different terminology <laughs> and. Um, it's a really simple, basic thing to kind of streamline maybe, but it's actually not that easy to do because we all have different ways of talking about the same thing. Um, and there's no consistency there from maybe the content creation or an asset creation through to bringing it on set and then into post. Um, and that that's just one area that I see, it can cause a little bit of confusion sometimes. <laughs> um, so streamlining or standardizing just terminology would be a start. Um, in terms of information and uh, data, it's hard because what a director and DOP, I find on set, you know, the focus is always quite creatively driven. You're not thinking about later or it's very much in the moment. Um, and that's where that's where the, the excitement is. That's what it's about. But the thought process is never down the line or you know what should we be capturing that may be beneficial so it's just about re addressing those things and i think re kind of reshaping how we how we capture but also how we record data and how we send that back not just with an image you know it's it's with everything from how this the content got to the server how this how it then got to screen how it was used in camera, a lot of things tend to change on the day um, that we're just not recording. So while it, a piece of content or an asset may be created with an end goal in mind, something may happen on the day that ultimately a creative decision changes um, how it's been captured. And that that really needs to be recorded and the information needs to be shared. Yeah, that's a that's really uh... It's really interesting. It makes me think, Eliza, about uh, as well of um, you know all the things. We often think of like the digital things um, that we we have from a digital form from inception. Uh, Dan, I'm curious when it comes to LED walls and then whatever's been recorded in plate, or even if it's been uh, so sort of tweaked through a process like uh, near real time uh, with uh, onset visual effects. Um, what do you see as some of the challenges for bringing the information about the LED uh, stage setup capabilities? You know, um, very often with lighting, you know, there's very kind of precise measurements and things, uh, and even those are not always carried over very well. How does how do LED screens uh, change the mixture, and how do uh, how do we go and uh, have a digital uh, kind of continuity for all the information associated to the uh, the LED setup? 
Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like LED technology at the moment is obviously, uh, you know, is developing like really rapidly, right? Um, I think it's interesting for a lot of the manufacturers now obviously putting quite a lot of time and effort into developing tiles that are specific for film. Like if you think back to even just 18 months ago, well, if to be honest, even only just a year ago, you know, we're still using an existing set of panels. We're actually never really made to do this. Um, and now the good thing, obviously, with a lot of manufacturers, is what I think especially going into 2023, back into this year, we're really going to start to see um, manufacturers working with filmmakers, um, you know, and other kind of technology partners in the pipeline to develop tiles that are specific for doing this. Um, and I, I, like that is obviously super important because, you know, we're kind of using technology and LED that just, you know, it, it was a bit of a whim and it, and it obviously works. Um, but everything down for like the refresh rates of the panel, the scan rates of the panel, um, you know, we're, we're going to see, I think, um, a big uptake next, like coming into the back end of this year of new tiles coming on the market that are going to, kind of really push this forward again, which is going to be great. I'm actually starting to see those. So, uh, uh, and I've been evaluating some of those in the last week or two. Yeah. Yeah. And no. they're very high res and they are very wide bit depth. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're excited. We, yeah, we're we, excited to get hands on, uh, hands on a few of them ourselves as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 it certainly there's, um, yeah, I think this year's the year. We have a tendency in the motion picture industry to borrow a lot of technologies from everywhere else and bend them to our needs in motion picture production. Uh, for example, um, we use dollies on set uh, to move the cameras around and, and to do dolly shots. Uh, those evolved from bomb loaders uh, during world wars. So. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we we do. I, I kind of feel like I want to get to, <clears throat> and maybe this is on your list, uh, Matthew, of things to get to, but uh, I really want to talk to uh, Dan and Dan about the application and Patty about the application of these um, distortion files to the images for use in Nuke, because for me, this was an aha moment. This is, this was an epiphany. This was the thing that I've been waiting to see for probably 20 years of shooting grid charts and having to, to come close, uh, figuring out the distortion coordinates or uh, coefficients of a lens. And now you just plug it in and it works. So um, I don't know if I jumped your list, Matthew, but I, I feel like that's a really important thing for us to get to. It's on, it's on the list now. And uh, actually, I think that that was uh, interesting, not, not having, you know, I, don't, I don't have experience working with lenses or, or, or being on set, but, uh, I, but I learned the other way around where, you know, wait, this lens distortion stuff is a thing, and this is how it's done. It's like shooting grids and just, I mean, it seemed, you know, it, it seemed like a very archaic way of working with what essentially you could have as digital information that's why it was so cool for me to see, like, uh, like the, the, the information we were pulling from the Cook lenses to get all this stuff. And especially, I think, on Commandante, there was use of anamorphic lenses, especially, right, which uh, have their own uh, their own special look and uh, special parameters. Uh, yeah, maybe they're, very, really they're very own special impossibility to get a proper grid out of. Yeah, here to well. four right. is impossible. Well, yep. yeah. Totally I mean, I've, I've tried shooting across streets from from high stories. You know, I, I've done every kind of crazy thing to try to get a complete grid off an anamorphic lens, and it's just never happened. And I've had so many vendors come to me later and saying, "What is this crap? Why couldn't you just do this?" And it's like because physics doesn't allow it. There is no way to get that picture that you want me to give you. You know, so here it is. It's not a picture. It's just there, there. is no. Yeah, yeah, we've been working on developing, um, you know, a unique way to map our um, lenses, shading, and distortion characteristics for a few years now. And we do feel like our anamorphic maps are something especially novel. Um, we have the ability to accurately map our distortion 
and provide this sub pixel accuracy because we know stuff about the internal workings of our lenses that really no one else does. So uh, we're pretty excited to introduce this and you folks have been really instrumental in uh, you know, helping us get the message out there that, that this, this ability now exists. And we're, we're really excited about it. Yeah. And, and, and it's expressed in anamorphic. That, sorry, ahead. Dave. I, I just want to quickly, the, the thing about anamorphic is like from a visual effects point of view, from kind of the, the geek's point of view, it's like, why are they doing that? You know, now it's a shallower depth of field and there's all this, you know, couldn't you just do that later in post? And what is most interesting about being able to use uh, the cook data is not so much that you're able to undistort it and put your CG in and put it back again. It's, I mean, literally on this, we're doing previs with by and distorting the lenses in previs, something that you have never seen before, where the director says, I want to do this in anamorphic. And it's like, this doesn't look right. This doesn't feel like anamorphic. And I said, well, no, it's a two, three, five aspect ratio. There's no way in previs to do this, but there is now. You can you can dial up, you know, like what's what's the director using? Oh, he's using those lenses, Do boom. And it starts to bend the way it ought to. It starts to breathe when it focuses the way it ought to. And it that's in previs. That's in something that's utterly different than what it was ever designed for, but it's already changing how people look at what they're seeing. Because frankly, anamorphic distortion is beautiful. That's why people use it. It's a pain in the ass in every other way. There's no good reason anymore. It used to be for a reason that doesn't exist anymore. There, it stays because it's beautiful and you, you want to keep it. <laughs> and now it can be expressed as third order polynomials. Uh, which uh, can be plugged into mathematical systems that account for the fact that anamorphic lenses have two entrance pupils. Right. Um, what, I, what, I, what I find really great about this is, you know, this technique of uh, applying visual effects uh, shortly after you know, said cut uh, within minutes, uh, which was the, the technique pioneered um, by, by you find folks uh, and with, with our with our help as well as I mean it, it requires all the pieces to come together right um, the software to be able to ingest lens metadata we need to have the LED screens and uh, kind of give really good uh, lighting so that we can then go and uh, replace them but in a way where you know everything looks still consistent uh, you know uh, all, all of these things uh, tracking systems with camera uh, all the stuff uh, comes together, uh, and I think it's really great. Um, we have uh, five minutes left. Um, my, I, I had one last question on the, the, the panel, but I think maybe we can have a quick look at uh, some of the questions coming in from the audience and see if there's uh, any that uh, are quite juicy. So just give me a second to pull up um, some of the questions here. While you're looking, I'll go ahead and answer one. Uh, uh, someone, let me see who, uh, uh, Matt Tegner said, would, it would be nice to have something like USD or Alembic for metadata. We are working on USD for metadata even now. There's, there's a great question here from uh, Christian Ferrero. Uh, he's a DIT uh, and uh, says in Colombia, the technology is a little bit new, and I imagine that's the case in uh, other places in the world. Um, and wants to be aware of uh, you know, this for the future, like what's the best way to learn? That was actually kind of the last question I had for us was, how do we uh, um, how do we disseminate information? I mean, one thing that I always found really amazing about uh, the way uh, uh, Epic kind of came into the scene with, you know, uh, everybody thought of so like game, game engines reaching this level finale, but in a way they did something bigger than that by trying to educate a lot of folks in, in a, a new production technique. How do we how do we continue that process and how have more people involved? How do we get this into the hands of more people in the world making the barrier to entry something that's uh, achievable for everyone? Um, what, what are some of the thoughts you guys have on that? Well, I agree with you that there seems to be like a pretty big gap in educating folks about what the data, what data is available and how to use it. And um, 
we've struggled with that for years. We've um, tried to figure out how to best get as a lend manufacturer. We're, again, we're sort of trapped. We can't um, get that data down downstream. Other people, we have to rely on other people to get that downstream. So um, we have tried to create a potential file, JSON file instruction uh, format to store lens data, um, but getting everybody to use it so that we can actually create a plug and play type solutions that would make everybody happy is still evolving, right? We, we're still working on that. Back in the day, uh, I used to do a lot of motion control. Uh, I owned a, a company in Van Nuys called Motion Control Rental Services. In the late 1990s, um, I worked with Bill Tondro and Al Miller and Paul Johnson, two different uh, motion control software companies, to create uh, camera data recorders from motion control systems. And I built uh, encoders that I could strap onto a dolly. Uh, I built encoder pan tilt heads. Uh, Nolan Murdoch of Panavision installed pan and tilt encoders on two pan heads for me for a Batman movie. <clears throat> I uh, would rubber band strap encoders to the sides of, of lenses uh, to the gears so that I could read those uh, lenses in my own random increments. And um, I recorded all of that with a motion control system uh, with, a, with a sync bloop at the start of a take. And we could take those uh, out of the motion control system as comma-separated comma value files, CSVs, and we could apply that to the CG work. And this was in the 1990s. Uh, mm. And I've been trying to roll this rock up the hill ever since. And I think I got involved, uh, it must have been 2004 or 2005 with Les Zellin at Cook asking him, how can I get data out of lenses? Uh, and around that time, I think it was in 2005, through the ASC and AVID, I organized a metadata summit at NAB to talk about all of this. And if we count 2005 to now, I think there's probably been, I guess that makes it a 17 year adoption curve on this. I mean, the the bottom line that I've discovered on this project is that it it isn't so much that what we're doing is new. It's that we're open to finding what's already there. I mean, the stuff that Cook did could not be as beautiful as and useful and everything if it was like a year ago. I said to them, "Oh, we're going to need to be able to use lens data on this project. It wouldn't be of any use to us, really. It takes a long time to make a lens, let alone to be able to figure out the best way to record it and everything else." So there's, it's what what's happened. I don't know if it's the game engines. I don't know if it's the LED walls. I don't know exactly which part of this whole paradigm sort of ignited it. What was the catalyst? But all this stuff that was out there is suddenly flooding in and allowing us to make sense of it because really you know I, I, dave will know this you know there's the metaphor of the five blind men and the elephant you know where they all get a different piece and think they know everything about it that's exactly where we are right now we don't know what it is really because we're still figuring it out and like one one thing just to sort of you know with led panels and all that technology that's running but because we're able to save the metadata and because that's allowing us to not necessarily care about the resolution of the screen, we also don't actually have to care that there's a screen. I mean, in some cases where if we want a daylight foreground with real sun on people's faces, which can almost not be reproduced any other way, there's no real reason why we can't do that and replace what's behind them, regardless of what it is. And that doesn't change anything about the paradigm we're talking about, except for what's behind the actor. Like Everything else is exactly the same. I think the integrity to the creative vision has been there on this project from the beginning and that it's actually the creative that's driving the use of the, the technology and the want to use technology differently or to expand it. It's that integrity. 
That's a, I think that's a really beautiful way of putting it, Liza. And, uh, I think that's one of the things that um, this group of blind people coming together around the elephant all uh, agree on is that the integrity of the creative vision is uh, paramount. And hopefully uh, all of us talking together are able to paint a clearer picture of the elephant for everyone else by having this discussion. Um, I think that's all the, the time we have for this session. I just want to give a very sincere thanks to everyone, uh, not just for the collaboration that we've done together with our respective uh, companies and efforts, uh, but just also for um, you know helping to uh, discuss something I think is very near and dear to a lot of folks in the industry. And hopefully it's uh, giving other folks uh, the interest to uh, move forward and uh, push boundaries as well in their uh, own respective projects. So. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing to work with you guys and uh, wishing you all the, the best, of, uh, best of success. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.